Hello, 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 everyone in my, or in this, because this is our weekly faith project. How are you doing? How is it going? We are in week four of increasing our faith, deepening our faith. And I really need to let you guys know that there is a woman that She's not on the internet. She's actually, she's an elderly uh, woman. She's my friend. She's my neighbor. And she's also a part of this group. So if you guys are praying for each other every week, please include Miss Wileen, W-Y-L-E-N-E Peterson. Because after we get together on Sunday, I get together with her. I go to her home and I do the exact same lesson with her. And she is having a blast. She is 79 years old and it, it never fails like clockwork. When I get off work, she knows I get home about six o'clock. I usually get to her place about 6.15 after I get settled in. And when I get over there, knock on her door, she's got her book ready. It's open and she is just ready to go. And our sessions usually last for about an hour. And the funny thing about this meeting with her is, you know, I'm always like, you know, it's my thing that older women are here to teach and instruct the younger women. And so I get so insecure when I'm around her because I look at her as my elder and as the older woman and that I need to sit at her feet and learn from her. But we, I end up doing the Bible lesson and she ends up actually taking over. <laughs> And, and it's not her intention, but it just comes out because there's so much inside of her that she wants to share. There's so much inside of her that's still living and active and alive. And let me tell you something. It came from her, me introducing this to her and allowing each other, me and her, to borrow each other's faith. So I hope that you guys are building relationships with people who you're... Um, just in daily conversations with letting them know that you're a part of this 52 week Bible study series, faith series, and um, in allowing in our allowing yourselves to be opened up to have people borrow your faith so that they can learn more about who you are and who your God is and why this God is your God and how He's increasing your faith every day. So we are in week four, and I am promising not to go over for a long time. I, I usually try to keep the follow-ups anywhere between seven to eight minutes. So that intro <laughs> was probably a good five minutes. So I'm just going to keep this brief. Brief. Week four, our title is Faith is Necessary. And you know what? We could just stop right there. Faith is necessary. We all know that faith is necessary. And wherever you are in your faith walk, remind yourself that it is so necessary for you to be faithful about fill in the blank, about my children. I need to be faithful for the future of my children. I need to be faithful that one day I will be married. I need to be faithful that and somebody just paid their car off. Go Avis. I can be faithful that I am paying off my car, that my car is paid off and I'm on my way to being debt free. Faith is necessary for all of these things to come into fruition. The scripture reads, Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, when you think about the word earnestly, it's not a lackadaisical word. It's not a lackadaisical expression. It's not it doesn't mean that those who seek God are just kind of humdrum and dragging their feet. When you seek God earnestly, it's like you're using every ounce of energy within your being to, to um, go after God, to seek God, to um, 
to make him almost notice you and to notice your prayers, earnestly seeking him. When was the last time you earnestly sought God? <laughs> if you haven't in a while, you have about three days left in this week to practice that, earnestly seeking God. If you're like me, middle-aged, and it's hard for you to pray on your knees, grab a pillow. Grab a pillow, put it on the floor, get on your knees and earnestly seek God and reach out to God. He loves that and he'll meet you. He'll meet you more than halfway. It says faith is necessary for salvation, yes, for heaven, yes, but also for this pleasing God. Just as a child longs to please his father, the faithful heart longs to please the heavenly father. That's what it's all about. We want to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is necessary. They go together. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is necessary. And if you're pondering on the statements that I sent out early this week, I challenged you all to include God in your details. I hope you're doing that. I hope you I hope you are remembering to include God in all of the details. What would God want me to do in this situation? And what kind of glory would it bring God if I were to go forth in this? If I were to do what I'm spiritually called to do versus doing what I normally do or what I want to do, how can I bring glory to God in this situation? <laughs> It also says in um, the text of this chapter is there are things that we can do that make God smile. Did you know that? <laughs> there are things that you can do. I want you to close your eyes and envision God smiling down on you because of something that you just thought, because of something that you just done, that you did. You caused God to smile. What does that look like for you? How do you envision God smiling because of something that you've done? We have the capability to do that. Don't discredit yourself in not believing that you have the ability to cause God to smile. It also says we, cause, we can make God sing. How about that? And how heavenly is it? for God to sing about us, about something that we've done. You know, the Psalms are filled with songs of David, how David sang to God. So flip the script, we're able to allow God to sing to us, to sing about us, and to sing about something that we've done that's worthy of him singing. That is so cool. But in order to do that, in order to believe that, Faith is necessary. So um, I hope you guys are pondering on your um, statements this week. And they're basically um, around, centered around you including God in your details. And lastly, what I, how I wanted to close today is I want to share a story with you. Some of you may have heard this story before. This is a personal story that happened to me. It's true. It happened. It was a, almost a 20-year life lesson. Before I became a Christian, I became a Christian in 1992. That's when I became a baptized Christian. But before then, I was out there. I was promiscuous. I was looking for love in all of the wrong, wrong places, in all of the wrong ways. And there was this one gentleman that I was really, really sweet about, sweet on. His name was Darren Booz, B-O-O-Z-E. And I thought he was just everything, everything that I could have ever wanted or imagined. Um, I was young. I was trying to make it on my own here with young Marcus. I was working at a 
uh, at a, um, what do you call it? One of those novelty shops in North Cap, North the Cap Mall called Spencer Gifts. It was in, it was owned by Intrigue Jewelry, but it was Spencer Gifts. Some of you guys remember Spencer Gifts. But ba Darren was a manager for Popeyes. He was making money. And back then to be a manager of a, a fast food chain, you, you made a pretty decent change. And I don't, I don't, I don't remember how we met, but I really, really liked him. And I thought he was into me as much as I was into him. Beknownst little to beknownst to me that he was not into me as much as I was into him. Darren only came around when there was nothing else left for him to do, when he was bored. You know, I was his, always his um, last resort. And I didn't, I didn't notice that in the beginning, but as the relationship, which I thought was a relationship, it wasn't a relationship, as it prolonged, I realized, okay, he only comes around when he wants to come around. And I want more out of the relationship. relationship. So I found myself just most times, most nights, just laying in my bed, crying, curled up in a ball, asking God, begging God to make this man mine, 100% mine, to make him available to me more than he gave himself access to me. And night after night after night, I would cry and my pillow would be soaked, soaked, literally soaked over this man because I really wanted him to like me. He was a Kappa. He always wore red and white. He loved house music. He danced. I loved dancing. He, he drove a a Monte Carlo with Louisiana plates. He was from Louisiana, all that. I just thought that, man, I, I, I hit the jackpot with this guy right here. And he like little old me. Well, he really wasn't that into me. And one night when I prayed, I heard the spirit respond to me just as clear as if I was talking to someone face to face. And the spirit told me, no, I will and you will find out why later. So it almost shook me like, really? God couldn't have said that. He couldn't have meant that. He knows my heart and he knows how much I'm longing, earnestly seeking this man. But God said, no, didn't tell me why. Didn't clue me in as to why. I didn't catch him with another girl. I didn't back then, I guess we really didn't have cell phones, you know, didn't have the capability to look through his phone or whatever. But anyway, you guys get the message. So this was around, this was before 1992, before I became a Christian. So it was around the late 1980s, the end, late 80s, early 90s. So fast forward till about 2010, 2013, I was managing a hotel in Gwinnett County. That day we had Aldi, the corporate office, renting out meeting space because they were doing on-site interviews. They were doing hiring that day. In walks Darren Bowles. This is like almost, I don't know, 10, 15 years later. Soon as he walked through that hotel door, our eyes just locked. I instantly knew who he was. He instantly knew who I was. When I saw him, I gasped. I was like, <gasps> and not because I was so excited to see him, but because of what I saw. His body frame was almost skeletal. He was so thin, like sickly thin. You know, when someone loses a lot of weight and all you see is just skin and bones, it was just very, very thin. He had a little thin briefcase under his arm. He had on a suit, but the suit was very old and it, it overhung him. The shoulder parts of the suit were, um, they were just, loosely hanging off of his shoulders and the ends of the sleeves were almost to his fingers. I can tell that 
instantly that he had been through a hard life. And that same voice that I heard tell me, no, he could not be mine. I could not be his, answered me and said, I can show you better than I can tell you. A lot of times when we want what we want at the moment that we want it, we're not receptive to hearing advice as to why this is not good for you right now. And I know that would have been the case for me because I would have argued God down. I know what I want this one time. I know I'm certain, I'm sure. And God said, no. And it was, I could only understand why God said no by removing me from that situation and allowing it to manifest and walk through that door. And I was like, thank you, God, for looking out for me. So I want to end this, this uh, follow-up to say faith is so necessary. If you're asking for something and God hasn't answered right now, or if he's telling you not right now, trust it. Trust it. He knows why he's prolonging that very thing that you're so earnestly wanting to obtain and achieve and to, to have that he may think it may not be good for you right now. Faith is necessary. Understand that God knows us. He knows what's best for us. And if we lean into that and trust that, trust and believe he knows what's best for us. And, 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 and the best way to do that is to grow your faith. Grow your faith. Be more faithful while you're waiting. Be more faithful while you're praying. Be more faithful while you're crying. God will answer. He loves you. You're his daughter and you're his son. I love you guys and I'll see you on Sunday.